Um, I'd like to, to welcome Bharath Hariharan to our, our virtual seminar. So he's an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at Cornell University. And prior to that, he got his PhD at UC Berkeley and also did a stint at, at Facebook AI research where during his PhD and his time at FAIR, he's done some really foundational work on, on object detection, instant segmentation and images. And now he's moving forward and developing um, even deeper perception in terms of 3D shapes, um, less supervision, and many of these kinds of fundamental questions in terms of how to reason about the, the surrounding environments. So um, Barath will, will speak about now a question of representation in 3D computer vision. Um. Thanks a lot, Angela for, the, Angela, for that great introduction. Um, actually, that sort of preempts a couple of my slides. So um, the uh, first I want to talk about where I come from, which is from the world of recognition. So I am not, uh, I have not traditionally worked on, or like I have not in the past worked that much on 3D understanding before. So in my PhD and throughout my postdoc, I was doing, working mostly on problems related to recognition. So image classification, given an image like this, you want to say that this is an image of a street, or you want to identify bounding boxes that correspond to objects. So you want to say that this particular bounding box is a car. Um, but and we, we've made a lot of progress on this in the past, especially once convolutional networks came into the play. Um, all of these tasks basically reduced to get a training set, pipe these images through a convolutional network architecture and um, train it using labels to produce the output you desire. Um, so once these problems, we were making a lot of progress, I was uh, wondering what um, we should do next. And one obvious thing was that the world is 3D, but the outputs we are producing are all 2D. Like the outputs we are producing in recognition are all 2D. So um, I was started looking into this problem of how do we develop a more 3D understanding of the scene. So in particular, maybe given an image like this, you want to localize objects, not just in 2D, but also in 3D, maybe produce a 3D bounding box. Um, going even further, maybe after you localize the object in 3D, you want to produce, um, to understand the shape of the object. So produce a 3D shape corresponding to the object. Um, the, uh, I think for this particular audience, it's probably not, um, I don't need to motivate why this is useful, um, but for my own uh, motivation related to uh, sort of the increasing use of robotics, um, so things like self-driving cars, but also robots that are manipulating objects uh, in the home. And in both these cases, the robot has to know a lot more about the scene than just where things are in its 2D field of view. Um, so obviously I should also mention that this is not all of 3D vision, right? But um, this is sort of the problem that I'm interested, that, I, that got me interested in the first place of how do you go from images to the 3D locations of objects and their 3D shapes. Um, when I first started looking at this problem, I imagined that this would be, you know, fairly straightforward. You know, we've done this, we've done recognition for so long, well, all we have to do is swap out the outputs, right? So instead of producing 2D boxes or class labels, now I'm producing 3D boxes or 3D shapes. You know, how hard can it be? Um, actually, I should mention, uh, as an interlude that I don't, in my screen, I don't actually see anyone raising hands and or so forth. So um, feel free to just jump in and interrupt if you want to. Okay, so yeah, so I imagine that this would be fairly easy. I thought you could just swap in the uh, 3D bounding boxes and 3D shapes as outputs and um, have the same kinds of convolutional neural network architectures that had served us so well in 2D uh, recognition. And then we have a data set with ground truth labels. We have a frame and loss function and we back propagate to update the network. So this was my imagination when I sort of started working on this problem. And, but when I started looking at the uh, literature, I realized that it's actually much harder than this. So in particular, at the time that I started looking at this, which was around 2017, 
Um, this was, for example, the state of the art on uh, 3D localization, 3D object localization from images. So here is, um, these are results on the Kitty benchmark, which is a self-driving car benchmark. Um, the two bars here represent two different modalities. So you could run a 3D object detection system on LiDAR sensors, or you could run, uh, try to get monocular images and from just a single image, try to predict the 3D locations of objects. And as you can see, there was a very big gap. Now you might imagine maybe that this is because there's just my very limited signal in single images. And that is true, but it turned out that the gap was almost just as large, even if you used stereo images or stereo image pairs, despite the fact that we had made such a tremendous, a tremendous amount of progress in producing uh, depth from stereo images. When it came to 3D shapes or producing the shape of objects, um, the state of the art seemed even uh, clunkier, uh, I would say. So this, for example, is the kind of outputs that you might expect from the state of the art sort of single image 3D uh, shape uh, reconstruction systems in 2016. And this was basically the uh, exactly the kind of pipeline I was talking about. You just take images and 3D shapes and you train a convolutional network to predict one from the other. And the outputs produced by this, so this, as you can see, is an aeroplane, but that's all the detail that you can distinguish. You can't distinguish, for example, details about the wheels of the aeroplane, for example, the wings are all very blocky. There's not much um, the, the shapes are not smooth. Um, any graphics, any person in graphics worth their salt would say, this is really not very useful. And so would someone in robotics who might want to uh, precisely uh, know the shape of the objects to manipulate them. So what's the issue? Well, the issue is that the entire pipeline of convolutional networks um, has been designed for 2D recognition and in particular classification. And that means that there's a bunch of assumptions and design choices made that no longer hold true. So for example, um, convolutional networks operating on images use uh, what might be called retinotopic representations. So in other words, the intermediate representations are all 2D feature maps. And if I'm going to reason about stuff in 3D, then maybe 2D feature maps may not be the best way of going about things. When it comes to outputs, especially outputs that require, um, so that are very structured, such as 3D shapes, um, most recognition models can imagine the output to be a very simple structure, basically a vector of scores or a vector of probabilities. And so, if you use the same kind of structure, or the same kind of uh, output structure representation, then in 3D, you have a problem because the output representation is now extremely high dimensional. So if you want to represent your 3D shape as a discrete table of probabilities, which is a voxel grid, then it's a very high dimensional space, which means you actually, uh, the, the learning problem is much harder. And the, the network has to learn all about priors, about 3D shapes. The output representation grows with the uh, degree of detail you need and so forth. And sort of complicating all of this, I mean, all of these are workable problems um, in the sense that, you know, convolutional networks with 2D feature maps are probably universal function approximators. Um, you could, voxel grids are, uh, you can produce voxel grids um, uh, quite easily, but because they don't incorporate these inductive biases that um, that, that capture uh, 3D uh, reasoning, to do this, you would need lots and lots of training data. And that is uh, another assumption that standard uh, supervised classification pipelines make, that labels are easily available. Whereas for tasks such as this, that is not true. There is not, it's not very easy to get 3D bonding boxes and it's even harder to get 3D shapes. So these kinds of issues meant that the straight up, you know, feed images into 
2D convolutional networks and out pops 3D structure, that pipeline um, isn't really going to um, yield the uh, quality of outputs that we want. So this is what I sort of have been looking at, the, these problems, these three kinds of problems. Um, so how do you represent the output? How do you um, change the neural network architectures to incorporate 3D priors? And how do you maybe use uh, inductive biases about 3D structure to deal with the fact that you have much fewer labels. Now, it would be nice if I could show you sort of how using everything I've done, you can actually solve this exact problem that I've shown here, but we're very far from that. So I'm not actually going to do that. So I'm just going to talk about three separate projects that address these three um, issues in um, sub various sub modules of this pipeline. So, okay, so what do we need? Well, we need to change our neural network to include um, inductive biases for 3D reasoning. We need to change our notion of what we output so that we um, actually capture uh, shape priors. We are not reliant on extremely high dimensional voxel grid representations. And we need training regimes that can remove reliance on millions of uh, labeled examples. So first, I'll talk about some initial work uh, on the first, uh, some, some work on the first front. Um, then I'll talk about some work on output on representations of 3D shape, uh, which is where I'll probably spend the bulk of my time. And then if I get time, I'll talk about training regimes. Um, so neural network representations. So what I'm going to be talking about is uh, work that was led by Yan, who's a PhD student. I co-advised with Killian. And it was uh, uh, work that's a collaboration with Killian, uh, Killian's group and Mark Campbell's group. So the task we're looking at is 3D object detection. Given an image, we want to localize all the cars, say, in 3D. So we want to produce bounding boxes in 3D to say where the cars are. This is a problem that's uh, of special interest for self-driving cars. We want to do this from images. So we want to use either monocular or stereo images. We are not looking at LIDAR um, or LIDAR point clouds or other 3D sensors. We want to do this from images. Um, there is a lot of work on this, and a large part of the work relies on using LiDAR. So uh, the pipeline um, for these approaches is you have a point cloud from LiDAR, you have the image that you get from a camera from a single camera that's say mounted on the dashboard, and you to pipe these into some uh, 3D convolutional ne neural network that produces these 3D bounding boxes. And there's a bunch of work on this lab. There, there seems, at the time we were doing this work, there seemed to be the general understanding that you need LiDAR point clouds for this. And that's why the majority of the work was focused on using LiDAR point clouds, using sort of 3D sensors. There was very limited work on doing this with images. And the pipeline for the stereo or monocular image uh, work was actually fairly simple. The simple approach was you would take a stereo or monocular uh, image, you would use existing depth estimation work. So maybe a stereo algorithms or maybe some monocular depth estimation network to produce a depth map. And then you would take this depth map, add that as maybe additional channels to the uh, provided images and pass it through a 2D convolutional network that would produce 3D bounding boxes. Or you might pass it through uh, a some other convolutional network architectures. So if you compare, if you compare the uh, performance of these two approaches, so this is on the Kitty benchmark, um, this is performance on moderately difficult cases. So cases, so cars which are not too close to the camera, they're not too far away, they're somewhere in the middle. And on in red is LiDAR in this brown color is stereo. And what you see is that the gap between LiDAR and stereo systems is huge. It's especially huge if you have a very stringent um, criterion for object localization. So 
if you require an intersection of a union of 0.7, then you have a very big gap in performance. And this is an issue because you actually need accurate localization if you are to predict where the car is and if you want to navigate safely. Now the question is why is this gap? Why does this gap exist? A priori, it seems, and this is the conclusion a lot of people had. Um, a priori, it seems that maybe just stereo depth is bad. The depth is so poor, is much is of much poorer quality than lidar point clouds, and so you know you really can't get good accurate 3D object detection from stereo. However, we realize there's another issue. The issue is how we represent the depth that we get from stereo. So in both these pipelines, be it LIDAR or stereo, we do produce 3D information. In LIDAR, this 3D information comes directly from the sensor in the form of a point cloud. In the stereo system, we are using stereo to produce 3D information in the form of depth. So both of these do produce 3D information, but the 3D information is represented differently in the two pipelines. In the LiDAR pipeline, it's represented as a point cloud or sometimes in bird's eye view. In stereo based systems, it was represented as a depth map, as basically additional channels to into the image. Now, so LiDAR would use a signal that looks like this whereas stereo-based systems would use a signal that looks like this. So what's the issue that arises because of this? Well, if you, feed, if you have depth map, if you use the depth map as basically an additional channel in a 2D image, watch what happens when I convolve it with a filter. Let's say I convolve it with a simple um, average filter. Okay. So, on the left here is the original depth map. On the right here is the origin, the convolved depth map where I basically used an average filter. If I look at the corresponding point cloud, what I see is that what was well localized cars in the original point cloud, now with, after I've, I've run this average filter over the depth map, now these cars have basically gotten smeared out over the environment. This, in hindsight, this seems fairly obvious, but what's happening here is that in the depth map, because it's a 2D depth map, the neighborhood structure that we get for all these pixels, it only captures 2D information. So two pixels, two pixels here that are across these two, the boundary of this car, in the 2D depth map, they appear as neighbors of each other, but in 3D, they're actually very far away from each other. And so when I'm doing 2D convolution, I'm using neighborhoods that are actually not very physically meaningful. They're capturing uh, regions that are near to the camera and regions that are far to the camera and sort of smearing them together. So I might actually be losing information in this way. I might be losing the precision that was there in the original depth map if I do 2D convolutions on the depth map. Instead, we say we found that what if you convert the depth map into a point cloud representation first? So you could take the depth map and you could take the um, intrinsic parameters of the camera and basically project out the depth map, um, sort of unproject the depth map. You're using the depth map to get a 3D point cloud. You can treat this 3D point cloud as a sort of a pseudo LiDAR signal, a 3D structure that you didn't get from a sensor, but from a stereo system. And then, you could run the LiDAR-based object detection system on it. So this is what we call the pseudo LiDAR pipeline. It's extremely simple. You first use your existing stereo or monocular depth estimation uh, techniques to produce a depth map. And then you convert it into a point cloud representation and run a LiDAR-based 3D object detection. And what we find is that just this pipeline, just this approach, um, for, for one, it's very modular. It allows you to use any depth estimation technique. It allows you to use any 3D objection mo detection models. But the key thing is that this simple change in representation significantly narrows the gap between image-based and LiDAR-based signals. 
So this light orange bars now represent the pseudo LiDAR system. And as you can see, it almost halves the gap between the LiDAR and the stereo system. So the issue here was not actually the accuracy of the depth that was produced by the stereo system. That is still an issue though. There is still a gap between these two uh, bars, but a significant part of this issue was how that depth was implemented, was represented within the convolutional network or within the recognition model. In this case, simply changing it to a 3D representation instead of a 2D depth map allowed us to get a big jump in performance. So, um, so that was about sort of neural network representation. So how do we sort of um, represent 3D internally in the neural network? And we talked about sort of detecting the 3D object. Now let's say I want to produce, I've detected the 3D object, I've detected it in the image. Now I actually want to produce um, a 3D shape. Okay. Now <coughs> I want to produce the shape of the object. I want to maybe fill out uh, parts of the shape of parts of the object that were occluded and so on and so forth. This leads to the question of how do I represent the 3D output? And initially we were working with voxel bits, which are actually quite reasonable. They work quite well if you have enough training data, if you are able to deal with very high resolution um, uh, voxel grids as some of, um, actually as some of our work from Angela have done in the past. Um, but there is a significant challenge in, in that as the voxel grid, um, and as we want finer and finer details, we want to get, um, we want to use higher and higher resolution voxel grids, and that leads to a uh, uh, an issue of the size of the output representation. So this sort of motivated uh, Guan Dao, who's a student echo advice with uh, Surge, and um, uh, Ruojin and Shun to look for alternative representations for 3D shapes. So, well, how do we represent a 3D shape? I mentioned voxel grids, and the issue with voxel grids is that the size of the voxel grid representation required um, grow significantly as you require finer and finer details. You can get around that a little bit by only encoding points on the surface. Uh, you can use point clouds and meshes, but even point clouds and meshes do have the problem that um, they need, uh, the size of the representation grows with the fidelity you require. Um, meshes are also just much harder to produce because there's a lot more structure to the meshes that's not easily that's not easily captured by a neural network. Um, these are explicit representations, and for the past couple of years, people have started looking at what they've called implicit representations, where we use a parametric function to describe the shape. So this parametric function might uh, say whether a partic particular three D location is inside the shape or outside the shape or it might talk about the distance of that 3D location from the shape boundary, from the shape surface. Um, in these implicit representations, typically this parametric function is a neural network. Um, these implicit functions are great, but they do require training data that is, uh, that is of the form of meshes, or at least of, that is of the form of uh, watertight meshes, for example. And they make some, uh, some of them make uh, assumptions about the shape, or like um, and they have some constraints about the shape. Uh, for example, that the shape has sort of an inside and an outside. Um, on the other hand, when we talk of training data for, um, for, for many of these 3D deconstruction tasks, the training data is often in the form of point clouds because they're obtained from uh, sensors such as LiDAR or, uh, laser scanners. So the question is, how do we get a shape representation that we can learn from point clouds? So uh, Guandao had this, uh, Guandao and Chin had this idea that we can represent a shape as a distribution of 3D points, where points on the surface have a high probability and points off the surface have a low probability. So this allows us, if you have such a probability distribution, then you can essentially sample points on the surface of the shape 
You can also extract the surface by looking for points in 3D that are that are sort of that have the maximum probability. And you can also you, you have there is very little limit any there's no constraint on what you can represent using this because as long as a shape has a surface, you can have such a distribution. So that's all fine and great, but how do we parameterize such a distribution? How do we parameterize a uh, distribution over 3D space? Well, we can take the same implicit uh, function idea and have some black box neural network, which takes as input, um, so some black box parametric function that takes as input a 3D point and outputs a probability. If we want this black box to capture not just a single shape, but a multitude of shapes, then we can imagine that this black box also gets some shape code, which is actually the shape representation, some low dimensional shape code. We can imagine this shape code to be output by, for example, a generative model if we want to generate 3D shapes or if we want to do a 3D reconstruction from images, then this shape code can be output by a 2D convolutional network, for example, operating on the image. As with all the recent implicit function work, we can imagine this parametric black box is actually a neural network or a straightforward multi-layer perceptron. This is all nice and good, but there's a problem, which is that the output here, we want to be a probability distribution. And the problem with the probability distribution is that it must be normalized. It should sum to one across all of 3D space. Now, this is a problem. How do we enforce this constraint during learning? How do we train a neural network so that its outputs all sum to one um, over all of 3D space? So uh, basically, Guandao, uh, Shun, and Ruojin, they explored essentially two solutions to this problem. Um, the first solution came out in ICCB last year, and there the idea was that, well, instead of just having this, uh, framing it in this, uh, in the way I just described, let's frame our neural network as an invertible mapping between a prior probability distribution, such as a Gaussian, and the target shape. If we have such an invertible mapping, then what we can do is, if I want to sample points on my target shape, I can sample points from my trial, pipe it through the network, and produce points on the target shape. Conversely, if I want to ask if a particular point in my target shape is actually, if a particular point is actually on the surface of my target shape, I pipe it through the inverse of this function, and that gives me a point in the prior, and I can just look up its probability in the prior. So uh, Guandao and Shun, for, so the key here is to have such an invertible model. And Guandao and Shun used this uh, model that, was, that came out of the machine learning community, which is called continuous normalizing flow. Um, what this model does is that it frames this um, invertible function as basically a differentiable equation, uh, sorry, a differential equation, where the neural network basically parameterizes the derivative. And if you integrate this derivative from a starting time to an ending time, you go in the forward direction. And if you integrate it in the reverse, you go in the backward direction. So this leads to a shape representation, basically that looks like this. Um, every shape is represented as a CNF, a continuous normalizing flow. Um, the to, to sample points in the 3D shape, you would basically just sample points out of a Gaussian, pass it through the CNF, and it will produce the final target shape. And the a particular task that uh, Guanda and Shin looked at was in terms of shape generation, although really the intuition, the hope was that we would be able to do use this representation also for tasks such as 3D reconstruction. I must admit we haven't, don't have experimental results on that uh, yet because we um, realized that there were still some problems with the shape representation. In particular, an annoying issue with this was that it was really, really slow. So 
This uh, approach relied specifically on having an invertible model. Invertible models are annoying in many ways. And one way in which this particular invertible model was annoying was that it required um, a long training schedule. And the reason it required a long training schedule was that it had this, um, to, to use this uh, approach, you actually had to solve a differentiable equation, differential equation. And solving that required a long time. Well, it required a long time to solve it. And so these plots, which are almost uninterpretable to me, but they ca capture a sort of how much, um, so NFE here is the number of forward evaluation, well, function evaluations, like how it's, it's a measure of how long solving this differential equation takes. And the lower the error you require in the shape, the more function evaluations you have to perform. And the more function evaluations you have to perform, the more time it takes. So ultimately what ended up happening was that this approach was not very really usable because it took just a really long time to both train and do inference. And so we talked a lot about this and we tried many different ways of reducing the time cost by using other invertible models and so on and so forth. But we realized that the fundamental problem is that um, all invertible problem, uh, models are going to have this issue in particular because this is just such a hard transformation to do. To go from a Gaussian point cloud to points on the surface of a shape, it's just a very, it's an incredibly hard transformation. And why do we need an invertible model? Well, we needed an invertible model because of this issue that we wanted to normalize. We want a normalized probability distribution. So what we uh, decided to do was to say that well, what if we completely remove this requirement for a uh, normalized distribution? So let's just use an unnormalized uh, distribution. Let's just have some sort of a scoring function or an energy function where points on the surface have a high score and points out of the surface, away from the surface, have a low score. And there's no constraint that it must sum to one. Now you can use, um, uh, and now the challenge here was how do we learn this, right? Uh, now, why is this a challenge? The issue here is that the if there is if the if the scale of this function is unknown, then at training time I don't actually know how to create such a function. I have no idea how to um, assign different scores to different points in three D space. Instead, we realized a simpler strategy was to model the gradient of this function. So we want to produce, instead of producing this probability distribution directly, this unnormalized distribution directly, what we'll do is we'll produce a gradient field where at each point in 3D, a neural network will tell us which direction that point should go in to maximize its probability, to increase its probability. So, the advantage of this is that you could start with a prior, a prior probability distribution, such as in this case, uniform over a square grid, and just move points along this gradient so that they converge on, this, uh, on the target shape. This, um, using this architecture, so technically, you know, the gradient field also has to satisfy certain conditions, but we found that in practice, that wasn't particularly necessary. So in practice, modeling the gradient field allowed us to remove basically all restrictions on the network architecture. We don't care that it's invertible or not. We can basically use any straight up MLP to solve this, uh, to model this gradient field. There are some details um, associated with this. In particular, we also had to introduce another parameter, which is uh, sigma. So this work actually <clears throat> relies on work from the machine learning community. Um, the precise uh, work that we built off of is called score matching networks. And um, that work introduced this idea of, uh, smoothing, uh, of, of smoothing the probability distribution using a standard deviation sigma. Um, 
Okay, so uh, details aside, uh, basically this shape representation allows us to do a lot of things. It allows us to, for example, um, take a sparse point cloud and produce a tensor version of, strong, of the point cloud. We can take um, the gradient field and take the set of points on the gradient field, which have uh, zero gradient and use that to extract the surface. Um, we can also produce generative models uh, using this shape representation and so on. Again, we still haven't used this shape representation to do 3D reconstruction. And in um, a sense, that's what my actual interest is, but we still have to go there. But at least right now, it seems to be promising in its ability to capture um, details and also its ability to capture sort of fairly arbitrary shapes and topologies. Okay. So I've talked about uh, representation changes inside the neural network. I've talked about representation changes on the output side. Um, but a big factor that we've seen in all these cases is um, the problem of training data. So both the set of approaches we described were trained on fairly limited data sets. So the 3D object detection system was trained on Kitty. The, um, shape uh, reconstruction systems for training on shape net. Um, for self-driving, people have created lots of data sets, but it requires essentially a big company to do this, right? So all these companies have come up, cropped up that collect these training and this training data for self-driving cars. But for the general, for the more general problem, it's very hard to get training data. It's very hard also to get training data about 3D uh, structure of objects. Um, so this entire pipeline where we essentially frame it as a supervised learning problem is problematic because we cannot get for, for a lot of these 3D deconstruction tasks, we cannot get enough supervised training data because we don't have the ability to essentially enter 3D structure. So we need to change our thinking a bit. We need to think of other ways of, of ways of reducing supervision when it comes to such 3D deconstruction. 3D, uh, fortunately for us, 3D deconstruction is, um, there is actually a lot of geometry associated with 3D deconstruction. And if we utilize that geometry, hopefully we might be able to do uh, better. We might be able to reduce the amount of um, supervision required. So that's the last thing I want to <coughs> talk about. And this is a paper that came out at ECCB this year. Um, it was led by Tian Tian Wang, who's uh, co-advised with Noah. And so the problem we were looking at is just correspondence. You know, the sort of the basic, uh, very basic primitive in almost all 3D reconstruction tasks, it's tasks, be it stereo, be it structure from motion, be it localization, is uh, correspondence, right? So we, the, the first step is we have an image, we detect some features like SIFT key points maybe, we use feature descriptors and we use that descriptors to do, um, to match points between the two images. Um, the very first thing you might do when you have two images of a scene, two images from uncalibrated cameras would be to calibrate them, to, would be to bring, um, to identify the rotation and translation relating the two cameras. And that itself requires correspondences. So correspondence is really a basic primitive in almost all 3D reconstruction tasks. Um, and there's been a lot of work on uh, getting better correspondences. In this particular problem, we were looking specifically at the problem of feature descriptors. Again, that's where the representation part comes in. Once we detect these key points, how do we represent them so that we can match them uh, very well uh, across two views? It turns out that we've been working on this for a long time, but it's really hard to beat a baseline like SIFT. I mean, SIFT is just so good at its job in terms of matching correspondences. So we, were, we sought out to do better. We sought out to get better correspondences. The main paradigm that people have been using to construct better descriptors is to use um, contrastive learning framework. So basically we have some ground truth correspondences. We know that these two green points, for example, um, are actually the same point from two different views. 
whereas these red points are not the same. So we set up a training scheme where we uh, force the network to produce descriptors that are um, close together for these green points and far away for these red points. However, this training scheme requires ground truth correspondences. It needs pairs of points that we know to be matching across two scenes. Unfortunately, this is really hard to get. This is again, not something that you can ask MTurk workers to annotate at scale. The only way we can get ground truth correspondences or at least pseudo ground truth correspondences is actually to run existing structure from motion pipelines. So what you might do is you might take like a large collection of internet images, you might run structure from motion and you could get a bunch of these um, 3D points. And now you project these 3D points in all the different views to get correspondences. However, this um, has lots of issues. In particular, the correspondences you get are sparse. The correspondences that you get from st the structure from motion pipeline are basically those correspondences which have survived the entire sort of bundle adjustment procedure. And so these correspondences are biased. They're actually biased towards points that uh, you it was easy to match using existing descriptors because that's what you use to produce the structure from motion. And so because of this, you can't really hope to get better by using this. So this is the, these uh, structure from motion correspondences are bi biased by design decisions in the structure from motion pipeline. And so we can't, using these ground truth correspondences is not really satisfying. Another way to get ground truth correspondences is to create synthetic ones. So you could take an image, you could warp it using some homography. And because you know the ground truth homography, you know the ground truth correspondences. Unfortunately, homographies are a very restrictive class of image transformations, and in particular, they're all planar. So they, they map planes to planes. So this does not capture real world transformations. And so the ground truth correspondences you get from these would be biased in a different way. So we said, well, can we learn without ground truth correspondences? So we said, what if you only have camera pose. You don't have ground truth correspondences. You just have the relative pose between the two cameras, the rotation and translation that relates the two cameras. This is actually potentially easy to get because you know if you're capturing pictures with a cell phone, um, IMU sensors might uh, give you this. IMU and GPS might give you this. This is also something that you can get uh, out of a structure from motion pipeline. And there's a lot less risk of it biasing, um, being biased towards particular correspondences, because here we only get a rotation and translation matrix. How would you, you how can, can we use this relative camera pose to actually uh, learn a good correspondence match? Well, a relative camera pose doesn't obviously tell us unambiguously what the corresponding uh, correspondences are, right? For that, you require the 3D structure, but it does constrain correspondences because of the epipolar constraint. So for any pixel in one image, there must be um, the corresponding pixel in the other image must lie on the apipolar line. So this is a constraint and we can convert this constraint into a loss. We can say that, oh, you know, if I, if my network says that the corresponding pixel for this yellow uh, pixel in image one is actually this orange pixel, then the distance between this orange pixel and the apipolar line is can be thought of as a loss. We can also introduce another loss, which is uh, which comes for free, which is the cycle consistency loss, which is that if I go forward and then backward, I should land up at the same point. Now, it's interesting that these two losses and these two constraints themselves don't. Um, so if you think of these two as constraints, they don't uniquely identify the correspondences. However, what we found was, what we find is that we can actually use these losses to train a neural network and that can actually really work. But before we do that, we need to solve a particular problem, which is that these losses, both of these losses are in terms of distances between correspond the predicted correspondence 
and the equipolar line or another point. So to use this as the loss, we need the predicted correspondence as a differentiable function of the convolutional network parameters, as a differentiable function of the descriptors. In, traditional, in the traditional way of tr training for correspondences using a contrastive loss, this is not necessarily differentiable because we're doing nearest neighbors. So instead, we did this very simple th trick where we said, you know, we get these descriptors from uh, both feature maps. And then we take, we take uh, given a point x1 in image one, we take its descriptor and compute its distance with respect to all positions in the second feature map. And that gives me a heat map, a 2D distribution. And now I can take the expectation of this 2D distribution as my predicted correspondence. So this allows the entire thing to be differentiable with respect to the network parameters. There's some additional things we did, which are involving sort of course to find mapping and so on and so forth, which I'm going to skip. Um, during training, the training now is extremely simple. We just sample a bunch of points. Some of them are shift key points. Some of them are random key points, random locations. Um, sorry. Some of them are shift key points. Some of them are random locations. Um, some of the points we can actually use the uh, 2D heat map to identify that these are actually bad because the 2D heat map has a very, uh, is very diffuse. So we can actually downgrade the losses. And basically we train using the sum of the epipolar constraint, the epipolar loss and the cycle consistency loss. We can learn this now because we only require camera pose. We can learn it using large internet photo collections where, which, have, which have the camera pose annotated, either using IMU or G, GPS sensors or from structure from motion. And what we find is that compared to state-of-the-art descriptors, our uh, weekly supervised cam camera pose supervised descriptors are usually about the same or better. And this is important because it's actually all the previous work, all these other descriptors are actually fully supervised. They are trained with ground truth correspondences. Whereas our descriptors, the CAPS descriptors are trained only with camera posts. So they're actually weakly supervised. And what we find is that with weak supervision, we actually do better than, with, um, than prior work with full ground truth supervision. The reason for that is that the weak supervision allows us to use a much larger data set of images with real world transformations. And that really makes a difference. We also found that it helps with relative posts. And we were able to show that it, we have some sort of you know, qualitative results showing that it is able to uh, match across very different views and very different lighting conditions and so forth. And this is sort of a, an interface that uh, Chan Chan created where you can click on one image and it will show on the other image the predicted correspondence as well as the ground truth epipolar line. You kind of find that it's able to find these correspondences across very different views. So, um, what I've talked shown you here is uh, what I've talked about today is actually in some sense three disparate projects. Um, but they are the, the, the underlying thread in all of them is this particular issue, which is that the 2D recognition pipelines that we that at least I've worked on for so long are so tuned to 2D that they make assumptions and um, design choices that are not actually good for 3D deconstruction. And so the, the, if there's one thing, uh, the, the, the one thing that ties all these things together is that you kind of need to think about um, the inductive biases that you need for 3D if we want to take the progress that we did in recognition and bring it to 3D deconstruction. As you can see, none of these things hold together in the sense that I don't actually have a single system that will do what I want. 
which is to take an arbitrary image or an arbitrary uh, pair of images and produce the 3D structure of the whole scene. That would be great, but that's not where we are right now. But I think all these um, sort of individual nuggets have a part to play in making sure that we can produce a high fidelity 3D um, reconstruction from images with, without requiring extensive 3D supervision. So with that, I'll end now and take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Baroth, for the, the great talk. I think so. Anybody feel free to, to jump in with, with questions. Um, I have also a question relating to what you were saying in terms of putting everything together to, to make a, a system that goes from image to full 3D um, understanding, I guess, geometry, semantics, and stuff like this. Um, so part of that is about like these kinds of reconstruction methods that you introduced with the shapes. Um, and, and so can we apply some of the same principles you had to also reduce the, the training data requirement for, for these reconstruction approaches? I, I hope so. I, I would have loved to say that the answer is yes. And I really tried to push Kwando to say that the answer is yes, but he, was, he didn't actually end up doing the experiment. Um, I do, so I don't actually know whether we have reached there yet or not. So one thing, one big question is right now that the shape representations um, we had were trained on a category specific level. And so that means basically, I mean, that, that's a bit unsatisfying because hopefully um, to actually reduce supervision in, in some previous work with voxel grids, we found that, you know, the one way to reduce supervision is to have like a category agnostic model and that allows us to reduce like the amount of supervision we require. Um, so the question of whether we can do something category agnostically is still unclear. Um, the other part that's a bit unclear is whether um, I can do a little bit of algebra with these reconstructions in terms of saying, oh, you know, I have like a partial reconstruction and I have a prior, can I combine these two to produce like a better reconstruction kind of stuff? So I guess my answer to that is that that is kind of what I want, but I am not sure yet we're there. Um, I'm hoping right now, the only thing that's improved is sort of the dimensionality and the fidelity, but I'm not sure if we are there yet in terms of being able to reduce supervision for this, uh, for that kind of problem. Yeah, I think because this is also, of course, a big question for us in terms of that data collection for a lot of these tasks is, is not easily tractable. And uh, so that's, that's, of course, this kind of, um, less training data or better generalization is an yeah. interesting question from the point of view of, of representation and also of the type of supervision um, that, that we're using. And I think, yeah. um, so I'm also kind of curious about this, this particular representation, if you think you can extend this naturally to the scene level where you're gonna have multiple objects. Right. So I, yeah, I was talking about actually, the, the, the convolutional occupancy net kind of approach is what we were thinking of. Um, actually, Rojin was talking to some of the authors of that paper, trying to see if we can, if, if it's possible to sort of have this be sort of within their convolutional grid. So, you know, like um, for those of in, on the call who maybe have not, are not familiar with this, the idea in the convolutional occupancy net is to have is to combine the benefits of the um, grid shape re grid representation with uh, the implicit function. So effectively, you have um, a grid, and then you have a uh, an implicit function in each location inside the grid. Um, and so you could imagine sort of swapping the occupancy net kind of representation they use with this representation. Um, and we are hoping to try that out, but we've not actually done any work yet. It's more in the ideation stage. Cool. Yeah, I think that's that's also a pretty interesting direction for for how to move ideas from traditional convolutional operations to implicit representations, and maybe vice versa. So there's a another question on the the chat here. 
Um, what role do you think simulators will play in the future for 3D understanding? Like applications like robots, self-driving cars, and what is the main thing holding them back? So um, I, I feel like there's two parts to the problem. Like one is the recognition side, like the semantics, and the other is the 3D reconstruction itself. Like the semantics I see, I, I can imagine sort of similar, or rather maybe I shouldn't say semantics, maybe like the, the action part of robotics, right? How do you act in the world kind of things. Um, so there I see simulation working a lot. Like um, for example, for self-driving cars, it's easy to imagine simulators where you sort of crop parts from one um, scene and from a crop cars from one scene and paste them into another. Um, there's also, uh, there was an interesting paper that I just started reading early yesterday from Sanya Fiddler's group where they were doing this in the context of, um, I think, uh, medical images, like 3D medical images where they were using, creating simulations of like hearts and organs and so forth and creating data that way. The challenge I think is diversity. Like, so the real world is just so incredibly diverse that it's really hard to imagine how to get that kind of diversity from a simulator. Like, I mean, you know, if you imagine, for example, the self-driving car scenario, what do you do with to handle like that guy in some farm somewhere who has a homemade car that he's driving on the road? Or, you know, someone suddenly drives an ox cart onto the road, well, can you include that in the simulator? So that I feel is the question. I'm not actually sure. I had a, a discussion with Shen Long Wang once about this, but um, yeah, I'm not sure whether we, we are there in terms of diversity. Yeah, I think uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I think people have been um, investing a lot in, in simulators recently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think for robotics, it's, the robot, the, I think the roboticists really care about that because for robotics, the action part, there's a lot of advantage from simulation because you can sort of safely act in a simulation and not kill your robot or destroy your robot. I'm not, I, for perception, I, yeah, I'm not sure how, how much we can get from perception. But actually, Wanda wants to convince me otherwise. So, but, you know, <laughs> sort of, um, yeah. So I think there's, I guess, one more specific question, and then we're maybe out of time. Um, so there's one more question in the chat. How accurate do the ground truth camera poses have to be for a uh, good CAPS training? Um, you mentioned that mobile GPS and IMU is good enough. So we didn't actually test with mobile GP, uh, with GPUs and IMS, um, uh, IMUs, but I think Chan Chan did do experiments with um, lower accuracy camera pose. I'm just trying to remember where they are. Give me one second. Let me see if I can find it. Might be. Uh... And in general, what we found was that it was actually robust to um, at least some degree of error in the camera pose, uh, but. I will need to find the table somewhere. Um, I don't actually remember the exact result. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have it with me right now. But I think she did do that. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. So, for example, I mean, as an example, without any noise, the metric in one of these benchmarks was 62.7, higher is better. Uh, this was the mean matching accuracy of correspondence. And when she added uh, about five degrees of errors, plus minus five degrees of error in rotation and plus minus 2.5% error for translation, um, she found uh, the performance decreased by about three percentage points, um, which is so, which, which is a decrease, but it's not like the thing totally breaks. It's not. It's not like the. It, it doesn't break in the way like geometric systems break. If you have like you know matrix, on, that's all. Cool. I think so. Thanks again for for the wonderful talk. Thanks um, for having me. Yeah. Um, I think we can we can also move to uh, a private Zoom for for.